Hey everybody, well the current administration, they're going to be going after credit scores and how credit is used in lending. And today we're gonna to talk about how auto lending ties in with this. And we're gonna look at a couple recent articles for this. This one's out of Reuters, Fixing the Credit Catch-22, How Biden Wants to Make Credit Scores Fairer. Right now this would be a big transformation from the typical way that credit scores are used to determine credit eligibility and loan interest rates. And the biggest effect with this change is gonna be on subprime borrowers, borrowers with less than optimal credit. In some cases, much less than optimal credit. People in the 550 to 600 credit range are getting car loans, but the problem is they have ultra high interest rates, sometimes as high as 25%, which is kinda of like pouring salt on a wound when you have bad credit, typically you're not in the best financial position, now you've gotta pay all this extra interest. So the argument made out of the administration is we're punishing people that actually need the most help. Now you can agree or disagree with it, but let's go into what is being discussed here with the changes to the credit scoring and the lending. Now currently there's about 64 million Americans who are, what this article says, trapped in a credit scoring catch 22. They cannot obtain loans from banks because they lack sufficient credit history and they lack sufficient credit history because they cannot obtain loans from banks so there's the catch-22 to get a better credit score you have to have loans and credit history that's part of the uh, puzzle to getting a good score but if you don't qualify for a loan well then that adds uh, more difficulty to the situation so here it is reforming credit scores is going to be the one of the president's priorities as he tries to repair the financial wreckage caused from the pandemic and the president talked about creating a public entity that would determine credit scores in a more accurate and less discriminatory way. So as it stands now, lenders rely on big credit rating firms, Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, to determine credit worthiness. And those entities generate a FICO score for borrowers on a scale of 300 to 850 based on income, savings, assets, loans, history of repayments, and such. Now, scores above 700 are generally considered solid credit scores for lending, but they're looking to create a separate entity within the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau that would take other factors into consideration when determining worthiness for a loan, things like rent and utility payments. So even people with limited or no credit should still be able to get a better loan with such a high, without such a high interest rate in this case. So basically people with banged up credit should be able to get a loan that's in the prime range instead of 20%, maybe more typical between three and 8% currently. Now credit scoring firms, credit reporting firms, they oppose this move saying that they're already working to provide fair and affordable credit to all consumers. And they say that a public credit bureau would be bad for consumers because it would expand the money printer's power in an inappropriate way and its goals would shift with potential wins at Consumer Data Industry Association. Now here's some of the data that they're using to justify the need for this transformation. Right now, almost half of consumers in low income neighborhoods do not qualify for a typical traditional loan under current methods. And they're even talking about here using your cell phone bill and the payment history on that to determine your credit worthiness. So what do we think about this folks? Is there a need to transform the way lending is done. And I agree, there's definitely a lot of flaws within the current credit scoring system, and there's also a lot of errors that get made. Uh, for example, nearly 60% of complaints to the CFPB received last year were about errors and other issues with credit scores. There's incorrect data, there's uh, people that get their information mixed up with other people. Um, if you get fraud committed against you or someone steals your identity, that could also come back and affect your credit score and your credit file. And also people that choose to use cash, people that don't need credit, their credit scores get impacted. They could have no or a low credit score because of lack of credit history, when in reality, the lack of credit history is because they didn't need credit because they have cash. Now, if you're using mostly cash to make your purchases, maybe you don't need a good credit score because you never have to rely on a loan anyway. But if the day ever does come up where you do need a loan, or maybe you just don't want to drain your account to buy a car or make the purchase, then that could really come back to bite you without having a good credit file or credit score. 
Now, there's also a story in this article about a man. He's 51 years old, and he has a subprime auto loan with a 25% interest rate because he lacked credit history that would allow him to obtain financing from traditional lenders. So he had to go to a subprime lender. So in the case of this particular borrower, it changed his monthly payment from 640 to 400 per month. And that's going to be a savings over the life of the loan of $20,000, all because of that getting out of that subprime interest rate on this loan. Crazy, right? $20,000 over the life of a loan on a car loan. Huge difference. And it should be no surprise with these type of interest rates being put out there that these types of loans, these subprime loans, are going to default at a more frequent rate. Let's take a look at the default rate right now. It's actually much higher than what it was just a year ago. And we'll go to this article right here. This is out of Payments Journal, recent article, Auto Loan Delinquencies Rising Cards Next. Now, we've been seeing delinquencies rise for a while now, but the big hand of the money printers came down and allowed people to stay delinquent uh, in many cases stay delinquent without getting their vehicles repossessed we also see that with rents and with homes with the foreclosure um, eviction moratoriums so this rising delinquency rate may never turn into people getting their cars taken it may some people may slip through the cracks but we've seen it where it doesn't matter how late people get as long as there's protections put in and new policies implemented to prevent the car from getting taken you may never actually see uh, most of these people lose their vehicles and some are saying it's going to be a permanent forgiveness where they're just going to freeze everybody's loans or permanently stop vehicle repossessions nearly 11 percent of subprime borrowers with outstanding auto loans or leases were more than 60 days past due in february that's up from 10.7 percent in january and it's up from only 8.7 percent a year earlier and that increase marks the sixth consecutive month over month increase and the highest level of monthly data going back to January 2019. So the bottom line is it looks like we're entering a whole new world, folks, where finance is going to be completely flipped on its head. And we're likely going to see a lot of transformations occur that we probably never thought we would see. Uh, just take a look at what's happened so far. Did anyone ever think that we would have over 2 million people not paying their mortgages, but yet the homes do not get foreclosed? And now we're talking about 40 year mortgages to refinance all these people that are late on their housing payments. Uh, would you have ever guessed that there would be 10 to 12 million people behind on their rents, but yet protections are in place to prevent the landlords from removing these people? Also, how many more people would be losing their vehicles if it were not for the protections? So things are dramatically changing. And while many people say that they can just continue this permanently, um, I think it's going to come falling apart at some point. Uh, just look at this chart right here. This is the M1 money stock. And we look to the right here. We are just in parabolic territory for money creation and liquidity. And uh, in other countries that this happened, this does not end well. Is the U.S. dollar immune to the laws of the impacts of endless money printing? Well, we'll have to see. But I hope you stay well. Um, be ready because I think we're going to be entering into uh, some dangerous territory in many different ways, uh, economically, socially, uh, and much, much more. So continue to stay well, stay safe, stay prepared, everybody. Bye for now. Thanks for tuning in today. Uh, please like and subscribe if you'd like to support this channel. It really does help. And we'll see you down in the comments on this one, hopefully. Thank you very much. Bye now.